Oh. Former Georgia Congresswoman and Green Party presidential candidate Cynthia McKinney has made several trips to Libya since the NATO bombing and invasion. She's in constant contact with people who are still in Libya, some of them in Tripoli, which she says has not yet been fully conquered by the rebels. McKinney says racism has been a key element of the conflict from the very beginning. Ethnic cleansing is taking place in Libya, but it's not just confined to one particular city or one particular town. What we're witnessing in Libya is real life and death. And people are dying, people are being killed because of the color of their skin, something unthinkable just a few short years ago, particularly in Libya. And now, of course, even outlets of the media like the Wall Street Journal have acknowledged that this is taking place. I have just received a report, in fact, it's still coming through, of a general sense of lawlessness in various cities. Tripoli has not yet fallen. Approximately half of the country is still not yet fallen. Therefore, the people of Cuba and, quite frankly, all of the ALBA countries have taken the correct position that they uh, will not recognize the National Transitional Council as the government of Libya. The report that is just coming through is about Sebha, which is another area in Libya in which this ethnic cleansing is taking place. The latest reports from Tawarga say that it is no longer there, that the rebel vow to erase it off the face of the map has now come to pass. I've heard the same thing, and even more than that, what I'm hearing is that this ethnic cleansing has spread now to other parts of Libya. And if the policy objective is to embroil the people of Libya against each other in a type of civil war action that would go on and on and on so that Libya and the resources of Libya cannot focus on the upliftment and development and independence of Africa, then, of course, those NATO states and the United States will have won. That seems to be the objective, to prevent the people of Libya from being able to carry out the role that they had assigned themselves, and that was not only to develop themselves, but to also develop Africa. Now, the story has been that the Arabs, especially of eastern Libya, were simply lashing out at what they said was Colonel Gaddafi's deployment of sub-Saharan Africans as mercenaries. But you've been to Libya many times. Much of Libya is, in fact, black, as we would consider people black. Yes. In fact, on the truth tour that carried me to 27 cities within the United States and Canada, on one of those cities I was joined by a dark-skinned Libyan who proudly proclaimed that Libya was between 50 and 58 percent dark-skinned people. So you could theoretically see the situation unfolding that a majority of the people could be targeted for this kind of ethnic cleansing, which is very interesting for me because you've got a call for not only the United Nations to put boots on the ground, troops of occupation, but you've also got NATO forces there on the ground. They have been spotted in much to the denial of NATO, including the United States. The fact of the matter is that they've been photographed and they are there now. So what is the role? It's almost a replay of other examples that we've seen when the military is involved. What is the role? Is the role actually one of protection or is it the role one of incitement? And clearly, I think the pronouncements from the United States policymakers so thus far have been incitement.
Not only are the rebels backed militarily, financially by NATO, who could be held accountable for their actions, according to many authorities on international law, the U.S. corporate media has been in intimate contact with the rebels for the last six months, and they have only lately begun reporting on the ethnic cleansing aspect of this conflict. It would have been inconvenient to report that aspect of what was happening prior to what has been hailed as the fall of Tripoli, but of course we know that that, <laughs> that is not even the truth. And I think it's, it's important for us to note that we are under a massive psychological warfare effort and perception management is a key to understanding what is happening now. Therefore, we cannot believe anything that comes from the mainstream or the special interest, as I call the media, because they have been part and parcel of the invasion and the ethnic cleansing, the war crimes, the crimes against humanity that have taken place in Libya against the Libyan people. The battle is now shifting to the south, which certainly is not in the hands of the rebels, not yet. And the further south you get, the blacker Libya gets, doesn't it? Absolutely. And, of course, that's where that uh, 50 to 58 percent of the population that the uh, young Libyan uh, talked to me about, the majority of them live there. And I would just uh, add that while he was here conducting business in the United States, he lived here. He now has gone back to fight. He said in his presentation at our truth tour that, that the people of Libya would fight to the last person, to the last bullet. And I'm sad. I am saddened that under the watch of our president, that this is uh, taking place. Well, certainly if there is ethnic cleansing going on, if that's the objective of the rebels, then the darkest-skinned people of Libya have no choice but to fight. They absolutely have no choice but to fight. But here's the thing that uh, disappoints me, and that is that most recently we've had Ghana to recognize the National Transitional Council. So now these people who are Africans themselves who are racist Africans, are going to sit at a table next to people of Ghana. Ghana has recognized them, and, and uh, the Ghanaians have said nothing. The Nigerians are being targeted, and the Nigerian government has said nothing. What, has, what is going on with this silence in the face of an outrage? Uh, five or so years ago, we started to deal with local banks. So I guess in Nigeria, we've seen more as a banker's bank. And we have, we have a number of, of financial institutions who are actually clients of JP Morgan at the moment. We also have a, a number of large corporates, uh, local corporates, again, who, who are clients of JP Morgan and who, who we advise, uh, offering a range of services to. Um, your trading products, your advisory, your cash products, your escrow products, a variety of, 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 of suites of products. So we, we, we're actually very active um, in the Nigerian space and have been for a while. We see a lot of opportunity clearly come, come in, in the next couple of years, and we would like to deepen our relationships with, with a lot more corporates locally. But where exactly do you see the opportunities? More so because JP Morgan is known as an investment bank, global yes. investment bank. But obviously, the Nigerian capital market has been under pressure for some time now. The NSC is down about 15% to right. date. So the equity market doesn't seem to be the most attractive place to be. Mm -hmm. What exactly is attracting JP Morgan? What are the opportunities that you're seeing in Nigeria today? Okay. Well, we can't really do local equities at the moment, I guess, clearly, because we're not licensed. We're licensed as a, as a representative office. Within the context of uh, expansion in JP Morgan and in particular Sub-Saharan Africa, we're looking at different models over the next couple of years that will allow us to do more in the, in the local markets we operate. So in South Africa, uh, that we have been with an investment banking presence for quite a while, you know, we've applied for a license, we've received the license, and are moving into the local RAND clearing. Um, again, Nigeria is, is a very big part of Sub-Saharan Africa, and for us, clearly, is, is, is one of the, the growth countries. Uh, and management, JP Morgan management is really focused on Nigeria and what the model in Nigeria will be going forward. So whilst I can't um, 
commit to anything in terms of how we would look in the next year or two, I think the JP Morgan name will certainly be more visible. So are you considering, for instance, applying for a merchant bank in license in Nigeria, given the changes that we've seen in the regulatory space for banks? I mean, anything is possible. Uh, um, and and I, I guess not just JP Morgan, a lot of people are looking, because Nigeria is actually uh, a haven for investors. And, you know, JP Morgan sees, sees international expansion as clearly very important. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa for us is, is, uh, is clearly very important in that context. And within the Sub-Saharan Africa context, Nigeria is a key country. So there's a lot of discussion going on within JP Morgan uh, right now, which model will suit. Um, and clearly, no doubt, there will be a model that we would follow, whether or not it's a, a banking license at this stage, probably, probably can't, can't say. When it was, the matter was apartheid, and it was the states of Southern Africa that were literally on the front line. Everyone was able to find their voice. So I'm wondering where is the voice of people in this country and the voice of Africans on the continent against this? Some believe that part of the discontent with Gaddafi was that there was resentment against the pan-Africanist aspirations of the Libyan government, that there was resentment against Gaddafi's efforts to share the wealth of Libya with people to the south. Well, I think, as I mentioned on the truth tour at several of the stops, that we also have to look at this idea of identity. The question that was posed at several of those stops was, had the Libyan government allied itself with Saudi Arabia, would we be in this place now? And I think this notion of identity is very important to understanding what the objection is to allying oneself with other African countries. The fact of the matter is that Libya is in Africa. And there are some people who will never get over that fact. I spoke with a Tunisian who quite bluntly told me that he was not African. Now, what kind of mindset? I had to, to laugh and ask him if he was in the same Tunisia as me. What is it that is in the mindset of people that would deny them the opportunity to acknowledge in a positive manner who they really are? And that is something, of course, we know that racial politics has been played since the inception of this country, and that there are people who very well know how to pull on the heartstrings and use these racial politics, this ethnic division, to uh, various ethnic characteristics in order to divide people, the politics of hate. I have called it in the past that the United States helped to reintroduce the Willie Horton politics onto the African continent. And yet it seems that part of the politics of the rebels is to purge Africa from Libya. And if they don't see themselves as Africans, then, of course, this kind of behavior is perfectly acceptable to them. They see themselves perhaps as Europeans. And that's why they can stand so proudly next to Sarkozy and Cameron. French President Nicolas Sarkozy and British Prime Minister David Cameron visited Libya last week and promised to continue bombing the country until loyalist forces are totally defeated.